Berkeley. Um, and he's going to tell us about term assignment theory, SQL, and a tri-diagonal determinant item. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. I've actually never been to Texas a and so I'm especially grateful for the uh, invitation to come here. Uh, it's something I wish to not be able to come to the, to the spring conference. So it's uh, especially nice. Uh, I'd like to share with you some uh, work that um, uh, my students and former students bring you home with the mark of Nathan Moore, how we soon in house you. I'm Sio Katan and Mr. Joyce Chikon. And I uh, have been working on in an attempt to understand the duality of n equals to four young males later. And we came across some nice mathematical topological structures that are going to be the subject of my talk. But let me start with the with linear algebra. Let, let me start with the with an identity that we came across. Suppose Suppose I want to calculate the determinant of a matrix that has um, the numbers on the main diagonal, minus ones on um, the subleading diagonals, and I also add a corner here. There's a nice identity that allows me to calculate the determinant of this n by n matrix in terms of just multiplying two by two matrices and taking the phrase. This this Identity we will soon see will play some role in or to dot 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 zero. Uh, oh ah yes, all the dots are zero except except uh, the corner. The corners, the right, lower left. Kind of makes it a cyclic order. Now this identity is, is um is not new. Um, we have seen it in the state of Molinari, but it also later on we found out that it appears in some linear algebra textbooks from, from the eighties, probably known earlier. Um, let me also mention that uh, this is a discrete version of, of what's known as the Gelfand-Jaglom identity. This is just a side note, but um, to connect it to quantum mechanics, Gelfand and Jaglom asked what's the determinant of the Schrodinger operator. Of course, if we know what this determinant is, we, this is just a Hamiltonian, so if we know what, what the determinant of the Hamiltonian minus any constant energy is, we automatically have the spectrum. We just look for this for the zeros of this function. Uh, we just, just subtract E from B and, and look for zeros of E. And they found an exact formula for it in terms of the the trace of the path integral of some two by two matrix. Now one, one thing that's nice about it is that you know that in the WKD approximation, I can draw P prime, and then this, this element is zero, and so this path integral is very easy to do, and in fact reproduces the WKD approximation. But it also reproduces um, very nicely with your old step functions. So if I, can, if I ever get a chance to teach quantum mechanics from scratch, if they'll allow me at Berkeley, I would start with this identity and see how the students <laughs> uh, But anyway, this is just a side note. Uh, is, is the minus two from the corners? The minus two at the end of the formula? Oh, the uh, minus two is actually a little more complicated than that. Um, but yeah, it, 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 the, you're right. The value here, well, one can ask what happens if I general, there, there's a generalization, I should say, where you put, uh, it, it, these don't have to be minus ones. And then this would be indeed the product of all these elements. So in a sense, yeah, comes from corners. Uh, the way to get this girlfriend Yablon identity from the discrete linear algebra identity is just to think about the chain of atoms, for example, uh, and make the replacement with uh, the Ki's are two plus epsilon. So the, the position here is just the, the x, this would like the x variable. Isn't this kind of matrix uh, arising in the quiver diagrams? Oh, yes, yes. Except with one difference, though. The, only the lower left minus one would be there, not the upper right. Does that? Uh, uh, really? I don't know. I mean, the, as, if yeah, I were to put zero at the upper right, but not lower left, do you know what happens to this formula offhand? Um, not offhand, but uh, it, it is in this textbook, I think. I think what, I, I, uh, I can 
for a number, I think you just have to modify a little bit these numbers. So the structure is still the same, but the numbers that appear here will be different. And that too, I think it's just part of all of these things, so that might be But even this diagram, is, it has to do with quiver, writing potential for quivers, uh, it's major. Is it related? Um, I'm not sure, but um, this, this is the symmetric matrix. So I don't know how, how it would work. With, uh, I don't know how it would make an anti, uh, a non-symmetric one. Uh, uh, in the galvanism formula, uh, there's a choice on uh, P. Is P mean the order product of? Ah, uh, yes. Uh, it, it and but the, 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 the order based on which parameter? Uh, sorry? I mean, the, the order based on which parameter? Uh, the order based on X. So X is a circular parameter, but I have to put the points in 0 to 1, say. And this, this, the range of X is, X is really tiny here. That's, well, yeah, it's it's tiny time on time. this side, but it's the X of Schrodinger on that side. But uh, it's a bit complicated because the X is already, already integrated because it, there's a DX, so I, I guess. Oh, it, it, yeah, yeah, I mean, this is just like, people are going to say, what's a loop? So maybe I can use the board. So this is the X circle. And yeah, that's the, uh, I think I understand what you're asking. So the two by two matrix that is written here, think of it as this H field just in one direction, and the direction of X. So the, the endpoints are functions of X. And that is just the holonomy of this gauge field. This, this is a and that, that's the description. And then, if, if I can drop the V prime, then the this form, and then it's very easy to calculate. It's just the integral as the integral of that, and it reproduces on the spot if you replace the two minus E, it reproduces the WPD approximation. for a periodic potential. Thanks. Um, but anyway, uh, I'm going to go back to the discrete version. And in fact, in, in my case, the k's are going to be uh, I think the integers. Do I have an hour or 50 minutes? Okay. Well, you're very generous, because we start at 2.10, and it, it, it ends up So. Um, so the way this identity is going to come out of the string theory setting is that each side is going to be counting the number of ground states, the index of the supersymmetric theory, really. And I'll just sloppily refer to it as the number of ground states. And the left-hand side is going to be the number of ground states of a certain churn simons theory. The right-hand side is going to be the number of ground states of a dual string theory system. And then I'm going to, uh, the, the connection, uh, I should say, um, is going to be two S duality. So once we, can, once we establish that, we can go one step further and look at operators that act on each side. And they're going to be essentially Wilson loop oper operators constructed out of Wilson loops. And my real goal is to go to non abelian generalizations at which point the picture is not completely clear. But anyway, the, the connection between the two sides of the identity is going to be through S-duality. Or rather, a compactification where I insert the S-duality operator, or S-duality wall, as it is sometimes called, in, in the form of an S-duality twist. And on the one side, this system is going to be a short Simon's theory. On the other side, it's going to be to be a string theory on a certain space that is called the mapping torus that I'll describe in a moment. So let me start from the beginning now. This is to see duality. So I'm working with, I'm going to work with n equals to Fourier males, Fourier males. Gauge group is going to be un, but I'm, I will specialize for most of the talk in the case n equals to one. Although I'm really interested, I'm, I'm really doing this because I'm interested in the non abelian case. Uh, the action is that, sorry, I forgot some 2 pi squared factors here, I apologize. Uh, that's the action. And the complex, as usual, the complex coupling constant, 
collecting the angles and theta angle and this complex combination. And the answer to the duality that I am referring to is the well-known Talbot's Mobius transformation of power, which acts on the on the fields linearly on the electric and magnetic field. I denote the matrix, a particular S to the matrix by W. And the connection with a prime diagonal determinant identity comes by decomposing W into generators, the standard P and S generators of S and Z. So this will be a word of the form P to the K1, S to the K2, S, no point in putting S squared because that's not this one. So uh, the Ks are just the powers of the T. So what question am I going to be asking? I'm going to compactify N equals to four young males on a circle call the direction of the circle, the parameter of the circle y, and I'm going to add w twisted boundary conditions, which are slightly unorthodox boundary conditions. Classically speaking, what I would like to do is connect, make the electric field just after the twist, the twist equal to the S and to Z combination of electric and magnetic fields just before the twist. As I've written it, and vice versa. So, kind of set these boundary conditions of E and B. But because quantum mechanically, the electric field is the canonical dual in the QSD sense of B, that formula doesn't really make sense quantum mechanically because quantum mechanically I should only be putting boundary conditions that act on the Q's, not on the Q's and P's together. So how do we do that quantum mechanically? Um, and by the way, before I move on, let me just mention that on top of that, there's also the problem of how do I make tau close nicely, the, the coupling constant. If, if tau is not equal to, each, to its SO2Z dual, which happens in, in only very special cases, either tau equals to i or to the pi i over 3, Generally, that would not be true. And the general S and to Z transformation, or I should say S and to Z transformations are classified as parabolic, uh, hyperbolic, and elliptic. And the hyperbolic ones, which are the ones that we consider, are those that don't have any non-real solutions to this equation, or all solutions to this equation are on the real axis, which is, strictly speaking, infinite coupling. I'm not interested in those. So, the solution is to just let the coupling constant vary as a function of y until if, as, as, as I complete a full revolution, it comes back to its dual. Connected by this equation. This is what's known as a Janus configuration, I think initially discovered by Bach, Perle, and Hirano. And uh, more people worked on it, and Coyote and Witten gave it precise supersymmetric action with all the terms that I'll review in a moment and are going to need it. So let, let me review uh, the other witness construction. So let me start with the Lagrangian of n equals to four in wells. Of course, in their paper, the two pi factors were correct, correct, unlike here. Sorry about that. Um, and they try to make the coupling constant of theta angle a function of y. And they find that just, just making it a function of y, of course, breaks supersymmetry because in deriving supersymmetry, you have to use integration by parts. And when the coupling constants are functions of y, then you get boundary terms, or uh, sorry, the boundary terms, but you get also terms proportional to the derivatives of these things. So they correct these things, these extra terms that we get, order by order, not sorry. And they find that you need to add the term proportion, a term that is linear in derivatives of the coupling. And the term that is um, the, uh, sorry, the term not linear derivative, but the term that contain, contains uh, the first derivative and the term that contains the second derivative, and the term that is quadratic in the first derivative. <coughs> so these three terms are necessary: linear, quadratic, and, and second order. 
and then everything closes. And they also find that there is a restriction on how the coupling constant varies as a function of the circle, and it goes like that. If they got the tau plane, the, the complex tau plane on the right, then it's, it's like point, it's, it's like you start traversing the physical circle, the coupling constant also traverses some graph in tau plane. And they then wouldn't find that this is a very special graph. It has to be a geodesic, which is a, a, a circle whose center is on the real axis. As I go uh, along Y, the complex coupling constant has to go on the semicircle. How fast it goes, that's arbitrary. As long as you add these terms that will preserve supersymmetry, you can accelerate, decelerate, and so that's all fine. But it has to go, the graph has to be a semicircle. And that preserves half the supersymmetry, so eight supersymmetry, so out of the 16. Now, um, I'm going to add one extra ingredient, which is um, Gayot and Witten were really not concerned about the circle, but about the coupling concepts of <laughs> varying along the line. I'm just going to close the Kyoto Witten line to a circle and connect the starting and ending point with an SL2C. So by the time I've reached this coupling constant, I'll arrange it so that this is the SL2Z image of the starting point, and then I'll just close. And it turns out, and we check that, that as you close, the coupling constant, the additional terms that Kyoto and Witten add actually work out quite nicely to close continuously. So this is, um, this is a consistent classification. And I'm going to, I can apply it for any gauge group, but I'm going to start with the U1. So now we can go back to the question of how do I do it quantum mechanically? How do I, um, how do I put in that W, that SL to Z twist, in a way that's quantum mechanically consistent, not just classically. So quantum mechanically, let me think about that circle now as the time direction, just, just for the sake of discussion. We'll wait for a in a moment. And let me also take the temporal gauge in that time direction. And now we have wave functions that are a function of the three remaining directions. You know, there's psi A, where A is a Reading gauge field. And the SL to Z operators, the SL to Z, the, the W boundary conditions that we want to add this, this to other mode, so to speak, is now an operator. Because you can see the circle is now in the time direction. So I just need to know how the generators of SL to Z act. And they need to act in such a way that by conjugation, when, when, I, when I act with the adjoint representation on E, so when I do T minus 1 E P, that should be E plus B, because that's how the P generator works. It replaces electric field with electric plus magnetic. And B should go to B, and what does that? Very easy, it's not hard to see. Let's just take the wave function and multiply it by the exponent of the chern simons action, level one. This is a linear gauge theory, so it's very easy to work out. The S operator acts sort of like a Fourier transform. This has to act by conjugation, replacing E with minus B and B with E. And what does that is to multiply by A which D A prime, exponent of A which D A prime integrate over A prime and get a new wave function which is a function of A, sort of like the Fourier transform wave function in a sense. And we see that if we act with the electric field on that wave function as a function of A, it would be like taking the derivative with respect to A. That will bring down the A prime, which is the old magnetic field. So th th this thing really switches what used to be electric, what used to be magnetic field before is now becoming electric field. 
So now you know, this, this is how um, the operators act if the circle were in the time direction. But we can now link rotate and just insert these pieces at the point in question. And, and that, will, that will do the quantum mechanical trick. So, okay, these are the SO2C generators. T acts by inserting the Chen Simons piece. S acts by Fourier transforming with the Chen Simons piece. So, all together, if I need so, to. So, I have a question. Can you just consider the key equal to one neighbor, right? For the Chen Simons arc key. Yeah, So, uh, if you can then hire a neighbor, will this be the same as all? Ah, right. So, we will soon get higher levels. Uh, here, uh, what we find is that the, I mean, this is not we, this is, I think, well known in several places, but um, what one finds is that acting with a T of SM to Z, the, the, the matrix, is equivalent to multiplying <coughs> the wave function by turn time was level one. But you need, you're, you're right, I, I could multiply by one K1, and that would, that would add a K here. Okay. Um, so, so now if I want to construct that general SM2C element, the combination of P's and K, we just need to apply these things successively. And the result will be that an operator that takes the original wave function to the wave function that they get by integrating the original one against some, some one might, might call it kernel, like a threshold kernel. It's it is a function of the original gauge field, the new gauge field that we'll get at the end, and some intermediary A2 up to An minus 1 variables that I need to integrate. And these are the, the integration variables that came from all the integrations here. There are n k's. So there will be n times that I need to apply s. So there will be n integrations that I need to do at that point. So uh, that I, W, is what I collect from all these pieces. And that turns out to be an expression in n plus 1 gauge fields that contain all the intermediate ones and the final one is going to remain the variable and the original one. The three space right now is just R3. Just, just R3, yeah. With some boundary conditions. Ah, at infinity. Uh, yeah, in principle, yes. Later on, I'm going to make it a compact torus, so I need to worry less about boundary conditions. So, in fact, I'm going to just be covered here and not worry about the way we enter the But thanks, yeah. You're right. Boundary conditions, I should say. Um, so, now we know how to do it quantum mechanically. Let's go back to the original problem. I compactify on the circle in the y direction, and I want to insert an SL to Z twist, W, that classically does that, A, B, C, D by SL to Z matrix. And quantum mechanically, um, what I'm supposed to do is insert at, at the point W, which is really a three-dimensional plane, hyperplane, I need to insert that ec extra piece into the action, where I is this combination of gauges. All three-dimensional, and then at that point of W, now, I would also like to know what's the low energy limit of that. The low energy limit, I'm closing the circle. Now, as I close the circle, I remember that A n plus 1 was the gauge field just before the point of twist, and just here. And A1 was the new variable just after the twist has acted, just over there. And A1 is not the same as A n plus 1. But if the circle is really small, as I go around the circle, A1 doesn't have too much time to change too much. So in the low energy limit, I can just set A1 equals A n plus 1, suppressing the loose line modes, basically. And in fact, I can also forget about everything else. This is because for instance, young males here <coughs> living in the bulk of the circle, young males is um, dimensionally or renormalization re grouply, <laughs> RTE wise, irrelevant compared to Chen Simon's theory. Chen Simon's theory has only one derivative that's the most relevant uh, 
operator. These are the most relevant operators in the action. So I can forget about blocking, I can forget about everything else. And the low energy limit is really, of the setting, is really just you want to be entered Simon's theory with the action that is that IW. This IW setting A1 equals to AN plus 1. So that's, that's the end of the physics computation, the low energy limit in the U1 case. This Chen Simon's theory contains N gauge fields with some not necessarily diagonal coupling or not non diagonal coupling constant matrix. And what is that coupling constant matrix? Well, it's everything that I collect from this express expression. But working out with this exactly, the, this is exactly the matrix from the tri diagonal determinant identity that I started out with. So the determinant of the matrix of the linear, linear algebra identity from my first slide is the dimension. Oh, uh, this, sorry, so at this point I should also mention that in fact from Chern Simon's theory, the determinant of the coupling constant matrix is also the dimension of the space of ground states of Chern Simon's theory on T2. And it's kind of not hard to see by just quantizing the system. It's true for Chern Simon's theory of one gauge field. The level is the dimension on T2. And it's also for the case of many gauge fields. So at this point we have we have this. Going back to the linear algebra identity, on the left we have the dimension of the ground states of transcendence theory on the torus. As I said on the right, we're now going to construct a string theory system whose number of ground states is going to turn out to be that. And like I said, I'm doing this because I'm really interested in the relativity. What do you mean by Church Simon theory on Taurus? Church Simon theory lives in 3D, I thought. Oh, yes. yes so what do you mean by Taurus? Uh, so I mean uh, Taurus times the time direction. So the time oh. direction is just going to go on as it does. And yeah, yeah. Um, the space spatial part. part. The, the, spatial, the okay. spatial part, yes. Thanks. Uh, and then I can ask how many states does it have. The, but we can already see a little bit of what's going on before I even construct this string theory system, because the matrix that appears here, the, this product, but if you work it out, this is just e to the kn times s. That product is just the ABCD, the duality matrix. So I'm looking for a dual system that has trace w minus one states. That's the right hand side here. To construct the dual system, I'll just apply some standard set of u dualities. First, I realize n equals to four young males, as usual, on the D3 brain, low energy. The D3 brain is wrapping that T2, in which the transcendence theory lives. And it's also wrapping that circle. And there is an S duality to S, that's our, or SM to Z duality to S at some point along that circle with every point of V2, of course. Um, and it acts as a type that's a full fledged type to be duality. And the system is certainly not weakly coupled because the complex coupling constant kind of varies and its large values as well. It needs to be connected after all by S of Z. But um, we can construct a dual system. Let me tell you first what the dual system is and then prove this is really dual to the three brain. The dual system is going to be like that. It's not going to have that original T2, but instead there's going to be another T2, not related geometrically to that at all. Um, but that T2 is going to be non frequently fibered over this circle. The three brains are going to turn into fundamental strings. There are going to be points on this T2 tail down. But they're still going to go around that circle. The tau of tau to b is going to be the complex structure of the new torus. And, uh, but the strings are going to be weakly coupled. So that's going to be very easy to solve. And finally, the 
w is going to be converted to a geometrical w that acts geometrically on the torus. So everything on the left in the dual system is going to be geometrical. To get uh, from, uh, sorry, everything on the right, I mean to say, is geometrical. To get from right, from left to right, we apply this, we go over the steps of the standard, what is called uh, the 911 flip in 1906. Uh, let me start with the type 2B system, 2B system. And I have these three brains that trap the torus, in both directions 1 and 2, the original torus, and the circle. There are also six extra dimensions that are going to be mostly there for our symmetry purposes, but I won't do much with them at the moment. Um, the steps is first I have the duality in direction 1 of the torus, that converts the problem to the 2 brain, then wraps direction 2 in the circle. Then I can lift to M theory which becomes, makes it an M2 brain, and then reduce the back to A in direction 2 of the torus, and that makes it a fundamental string. The lift to M theory generated the new direction 10, and the reduction back to A on a different direction, in direction 2, eliminated direction 2. So if you look at this uh, setting, we started out with a D3 brain, and we started out with a torus in direction one and two, but we ended with a fundamental string, and the other important thing to note is that the original two directions, um, their geometrical interpretation completely disappeared, because direction one at some point was converted to something else by a key duality, and direction T was just eliminated when I reduced the type to A. But instead, we got two new directions, the dual direction one, and the new direction 10 here in the left, and these two directions are going to be the torus T tilde, T2 tilde. But it is not related geometrically to the original physical torus. So I'm going to call the new coordinates x1 and x2. This x1 is, in a sense, the T dual coordinate to the original, and this x2 didn't even appear at the original setting at all. But in the y direction, nothing really happened. So it's still there. Okay, so now we can describe the geometry that I end up with a little bit in more detail. Geometry is also called the mapping torus, um, which is gotten this way. Let me take the circle, which is the same as that circle from the original problem. Um, hope it's clear that x0 is just a, like a crutch. This was direction y, really. I take the circle and I open, up, I open it up to a segment. And I need to identify point 0 and 1 to make it back into a circle. But before I do that, I need to insert a geometrical twist. And this happens like that. Over the circle is fibered the dual torus. So it's just fibered the torus in directions x1 and x2. And as I go around the circle, going from point 0 to point 1, before I close, I need to act on this torus with some transformation. So in formulas, a mapping torus is a three-dimensional space that I get from starting with a segment and adding two extra dimensions with the torus, but I, ident I identify the point zero with the point one that's subject to an extra action on the torus. It's going to be an element of the mapping class rule, which means that um, if the coordinates of the torus are x1 and x2, and they're periodic, then f is going to act exactly like this SM2Z matrix. Or it should be transposed, technically, of the SM2Z matrix. So it's going to be a large transformation of the torus. Maybe then twist, plus this one, things like that. And the metric, well, the metric needs to be constructed a little more carefully, but especially going to be the standard vibration metric. The coupling constant is varying as a function of the circle, and, uh, and the torus is just the standard metric of the torus constant area of varying coupling structure. Okay, in pictures, I need to, to just say the same thing. I'm going to represent the torus as a, um, as a lap 
lattice, as the fundamental cell, I should say, of a lattice, or the lattice with identifications, and the identifications are generated by two vectors, we call them u1 and u2. And here I've kind of plotted in a bubble the torus, the, the torus in this representation, which is the fiber of the starting point. And let's say go along the circle, the complex structure changes which means that the generators of that lattice can change. And then at the end, when I reach the final point, the generators of the lattice have changed, have changed so much that it's actually equivalent to the original lattice, but in a different coordinate system. And we see that if this is our equivalent to the original lattice, and in this example, the, there is some linear transformation with integer coefficients, so it's a to z transformation that connects the new generators to the old generators. In this case, the matrix minus one, minus two, one, one, minus one. And that's the W. That's going to be the s of 2 z action. So now, since it's the same lattice, I can close. I see I can connect the endpoint to the starting point, and that's the mapping course. So it's a three-dimensional space roughly a torus fibered over a circle. And I want to put strings on that, strings that will kind of go from the point zero to the point one, but they're allowed to be anywhere they want in the extra dimensions. So you need to get the picture of what the dual system is, the dual to the free brain wrapped in a circle with an S and 2 Z twist, the dual to and it is to 40 mils, the S of the Z-twist is the fundamental string on a mapping torus. The fundamental string wraps the same circle, and it can be anywhere it wants on the fiber. The connection is U1. So now we need to count how many ground states that right-hand system has. But the right-hand system is weakly coupled. And in fact, not only that, I can take the circle to be as big as I want, because I'm really calculating a weakened index, although I didn't talk about supersymmetry. This whole setting is supersymmetric. Um, one can also wonder what happens to the motion in the six extra dimensions, and what happens to the fermions. But I should, I, I'll just say that all of these things are massive. So they don't enter in the calculation of the, they don't change the multiplicity of ground states. The motion in the extra dimension, um, there are mass terms in the Gayoto Witten action that pin this whole thing to the origin. So everything that happens happens in these three dimensions. Now, the string is weakly coupled. I can arrange it to be as weakly coupled as I want. But in fact, it's not even a string theory problem, it's a geometry problem. It's just find the strings that are of minimal length in this configuration. Strings that wind once around the circle and are allowed to go any way they want in the fiber. The only injection of string theory into this problem is that I need to make sure that each such string will have multiplicity one, and that's a simple string theory computation, and it, it is indeed true. So to count ground states, um, all, all I need to do is, well, I need to first make a decision. Is the, here. Is this point allowed to vary, go up and down sideways as I go along the circle, or is this point going to stay fixed? And it is clear that the best thing is to keep it fixed, because then I don't have to add length by Pythagoras. So I just need to find those points at which it can stay fixed. And why won't it be able to stay fixed any way it likes? Well, because it still needs to close as I go around the circle to close nicely. <coughs> so what that means is that, well, let's just say in, in equations now what I said in, in the picture, I need to find a string that winds once around the base of the mapping torus. And technically what that means is this. The mapping torus has the first homology group, which is, which is a, one z factor, which corresponds to moves going around the base. They can just go many, as many times as they want. And in that z factor, I want the string to just go once. So the string, the string's homology class has to be one inside that z. The homology group, as we will soon see, also has a torsion part. 
things like C5 plus C7 plus I don't know. And in the torsion part, I don't care what the string is doing. It can do, uh, I mean, it can be the torsion part of the string's homology class can be whatever it wants. Um, now, but the string needs to sit at a fixed point of A. This was A, the linear transformation. And it needs to sit at the fixed point because otherwise it will close with. So the problem reduces to answering this linear algebra problem, number theory problem maybe. So these equations mod Z2, because x1 and x2 are um, periodic. So let me say the getting pictures. So here, here I've drawn the starting torus y equals to zero and the ending torus of y equals to one in the generators. And, I, and if I put the string at the origin, which it goes from zero to one, but in the fiber it always stays at the origin, that would clearly close nicely. But this, so, so this is one solution, obvious, zero, zero. But in this example, two fifth u one and one fifth plus one fifth u two, the point depicted here is also good for the following reason. It's slightly less intuitive, but uh, if the torus gets deformed, that point gets slowly, slowly deformed into two fifths, one fifth in the new basis. But as it happens, the, the red point two fifth, one fifth in the new basis is equivalent to the old point via a lattice vector. So this can also close. And so can that, and this and that. And in fact, these are the only five solutions in the problem. So the answer in this case, for this matrix, there are five states. In general, I need to solve the linear equation for a given matrix of integers w and wp. I need to solve that, mod c2. And the answer is this. I need to construct W transpose minus the identity matrix inverse. Look at the columns of that matrix. And these columns are usually rational numbers, but not necessarily integers. The span of these columns is going to be a lattice in C2 that is finer, contains more points than C2 itself, contains some rational points that are not integral. And the number of ground states, I mean, the, 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 these, uh, this lattice is exactly the points where the string can sit. And the number of ground states is the index of Z2 in that lattice. That, that is the number of um, elements of lambda mod Z2, which, after a quick calculation, is just the determinant of W, w transpose minus 1, which is A plus D minus 2, which is also trace W minus 2, because these are the associated matrix. Which is, which brings us back to the tri-diagonal identity um, and, and kind of concludes, uh, sorry, I jumped a little far, farther ahead than I wanted. So, which concludes the right-hand side derivation of the tri-diagonal identity. So this is, this is exactly what we wanted to prove is the number of ground states on the right-hand side. So that part checks. Not encouraged by that, I can go to the next bit. Can I understand operators of both initial and dual picture from both Young Mills, Sean Simons, and the strings of Matthew Torres picture? So, what would be op would operators to consider? Well, in the Sean Simons theory, there are only Wilson loop operators that I can construct out of Wilson loops. And I can put the Wilson loops on one of the two cycles of the torus. Or I can construct everything from these two basic sets. If alpha and beta are the two standard um, uh, generators, the cycle, uh, are the two standard cycles of the torus, then I'll, I'll have two n young Mills operators to consider, and so two n Wilson loop operators to consider the u's, that are going to be the Wilson loops of the alpha cycle, and the v's, the Wilson loops of the beta cycles. And they form an algebra, which is 
kind of interesting. It's like a clock and shift. These are like clock and shift matrices. So the U's commute among themselves. The V's commute, but the UV's commute only up to certain phases. which are determined by the common constant matrix. Phases, determined by the elements of the inverse of the coupling constant matrix. For the simple single U1 case, the, the coupling constant matrix is a one by one matrix. There's just one number K, and the phases are just two by I over K, the standard clock and shift algebra. But in the general case, the, the whole inverse matrix appears. So the question is really, can I reproduce these phases from the string theory of mapping torus computation? So um, let me just say one more thing before I continue to the string theory picture, and that is that what is the operator algebra exactly? So the operator algebra is generated by the Wilson loops on one cycle u and the Wilson loops on the other cycle v. And the u separately commute and the v separately commute, and the u v do not commute, but there's one more thing that I need to mention to just uh, here, and that is that certain combinations of the Vs commute with everything. A combination like that, powers n1 up to n little n, will commute with everything. Well, it obviously commutes, commutes with the Vs, but can it also commute with all the Us? And for that to be the case, the phases that I would pick up when I try to pass a U from left to right through that thing. To bring here, if the 2 pi i k minus 1 times m is a vector, that has to be 1 for all i's. Or, well, which, which means that as a matrix, k minus 1 times the vector n has to be an integer, a vector of integers. And with that, that translates to is the vector of n's, the vector of powers, has to be a linear combination of the columns of the matrix k. And if that happens, we're, we need to set this combination to 1, because it commutes with everything. It's in the center, and in, in Chertanov's theory, it just turns out to be identical to the operator 1. So now we have to have the combination of u that form, or just <coughs> Ah, yeah, good. Okay. And indeed, the same thing happens with, uh, with you as well. Absolutely. So this exact same statement also holds for you. Um, but but let, let me start with the Vs first, because the Vs, as we will soon see, um, in the string theory picture, the nice symmetry between the Vs and U's is somehow lost. So whenever we get something simpler, we oh, oh, I mean, somehow we always have to lose some obvious symmetry. Here we lose that symmetry between the alphas and the beta cycle. So I'm on purpose starting with the betas. So the conclusion is that the independent operators that are formed from the beta cycle Wilson loops, uh, these are labeled by a vector of integers. And, and could you consider it as a generation of v for algebra? Because uv is plus minus v, but in your case, we have phases. So. Ah, yes, exactly. Um, th this, this is indeed in a sense, an exponentiation of the Clifford, Clifford algebra. And, and uh, technically, the way this enters is precisely through a Clifford, Clifford algebra, because the different components of the gauge beam, because the short Simon's theory has um, a temporal gauge, Kind of like an A1, A2 dot action. So you get A1, A2 dot commute. Mm -hmm. Um, the, vector of the vector of integers in Zn translates to a vector of powers in the Wilson loops, in the, in the Wilson loops. 
And like I said, if, if this vector of powers happens, uh, this vector of integers happens to be a linear combination of the columns of the coupling constant matrix, then we're supposed to identify uh, these powers with one. The coupling constant matrix is in fact. So, so from what I just said, uh, I need to look at the lattice generated by the columns of K. These are powers that correspond to operators that will be identified as the identity. That is the sub-lattice of the lattice of all, all vectors with integer coefficients, maybe Zn. And the, the interesting operators are the ones that are not in that sub-lattice. So the interesting operators, at least those that can be written, those Wilson loops that can be written from the Vs, those Wilson loops around the beta cycles, are identified with um, Zn mod that lambda prime lattice, which is a finite abelian group. It's finite, I mean, this, this just points with integer with the rational coefficients. Now, it turns out that as an abelian group, why is it a group at all? Because this is an algebra of operators. It has to be a group. But as a group at all, it's always a sum of two uh, ZD1 plus ZD2 groups. So there are two integers. That for this particular matrix, there are two integers that specify what that group is. So how do I know that? Um, well, my student, Hao Yu Sun, tells me reading through the literature that there's something called the Smith normal form in linear algebra. And every matrix, every integer matrix, you can um, bring to a Smith normal form, which means Smith normal form is just you find two SL and Z matrices, <coughs> P and Q, and you multiply the matrix by P to the left and Q to the right until you get the diagonal form, but not only diagonal, you're supposed to get integers on the diagonal, and each integer is supposed to divide the next one. And if you if you go through the algorithm of how to get that Smith normal form and take as an input this matrix, what you find is that the Smith normal form has lots of ones and only two integers that could possibly be non-ones. So the that is generated by the columns of K. If it's not defined, then the operator algebra has to be two, um, the, the sum of two cyclic groups. And this is what I need to reproduce now from string theory. So let, let me uh, go over it quickly because I think I only have five minutes. How do I get a billion groups? Uh, sorry. How, how do I get um, Wilson loops in the string theory setting? So I, I need to study processes where the D3 brain absorbs fundamental strings. So let me take this as the time direction. Let me take a D3 brain that wraps direction, wraps the torus that I'm talking about all the time. There's also a circle on top of that that I'm not drawing. That's just there as an extra dimension. And let me study a process where this D3 brain absorbs a fundamental string wraps around the alpha cycle. The absorption amplitude contains the Wilson loop as the phase. So by understanding this process in the dual system, I'll understand the phase. There's also a Wilson loop along the beta cycle that I can understand similarly by, wrap, by absorbing a string that's wrapped around the other circle. Taking that picture and going through the dualities converts the system to a string in the dual setting, the string on the map and torus that absorbs two different things. If these are in the direction of the torus, it turns out that absorbing the fundamental string of the alpha cycle corresponds to absorbing momentum in direction x1, and absorbing the fundamental string of the beta cycle corresponds to absorbing winding number. So what does that mean? I'm looking for operators on the Hilbert space of strings of this mapping torus. 
The operators can be, it turns out that the operators can come in one of two ways. They're going to be associated with symmetries, but what are these symmetries? They will be either isometries. Isometries come as discrete translations in the direction of the fiber. Or they will come with charges that are associated with extra discrete symmetries. And these charges are going to measure the topology of the string state, but the torsion part, the one that I didn't talk about before. So um, let me quickly go over the uh, group of isometries. This is the string that starts at the origin and ends at the origin. <coughs> if I push it by this vector, and exactly by that vector, I get the string, I get the next string state. So translating in this precise direction in the fiber, every point along the fiber is an isometry. And it converts the first state to that state, that state is converted to this, and this is converted to that, and that to this, and the last one gets converted to the original one. So the group of isometries in the spaces acts like this matrix, pushing each state to the next one. Um, Now, the other group that I want to consider is the torsion part of the homology that I pushed aside before. What is the homology group, H1, of this mapping torus? Um, here is a one cycle, so it should be part of the homology, except that as I go from 0 to 1, that one cycle slowly gets deformed to this generator, which means that in homology, these two are the same. But U1 prime is linearly related to U1, which means that in homology, I have to impose this relation. Similarly, U2 equals U2 prime, so in homology, I have to impose that relation as well. The combination of these two relations implies that five times the homology class of U1 is zero. So the homology group, the torsion part of it is Z5, the second group Z5. Let me call the generators gamma, circle and sigma for that C5. So what are the states? This is a string state. It turns out that in homology that, that is gamma. That in homology is gamma plus sigma. It's different topologically. Gamma plus two sigma, gamma plus three sigma, and gamma plus four sigma. The five string states that we identified are actually different in homology. And so I can measure their homology charge, which is a C5 charge, and that defines an operator like that, e to the charge, e to the homology charge. And um, that operator is going to be um, the other way. So I'm going to skip the calculation. Um, so I'll just, I'll just conclude by saying that thinking about it a little bit um, turns out, brings us to the conclusion that the the subgroup generated by the Wilson loops of alpha cycles matches the isometry group in the string setting. And the subgroup generated by the Wilson loops of beta cycles matches the measuring the charge in homology, or technically the triadic dual of the torsion part of homology. So it's mathematically, mathematically precise. But these are the two natural symmetries in the string setting. And they both give always groups of the form the sum of two cyclic groups. Now, to give you out of time, so uh, I'll, I'll just skip that. Now, uh, I should just say that the main goal is to extend to you and we have partial results. I can go over that if people are interested, but I'll, I'll conclude here. We found that the helper space of ground states of an SL2C crested compactification on S1 cross T2, Yang Mills, U1 Yang Mills. Um, in the one hand, it corresponds to the Hilbert space of ground states of Chun Simon's theory, but it also nicely matches the space of ground states of strings on the mapping torus. And the Wilson loops, and alpha and beta cycles, are realized in the dual picture as the isometry group and as the space of charges that I can build out of asking which homology class is the string in. Uh, and the computation relations match. Right? And check that. I haven't shown that, but that's easy to check. Um, what to do further? What I'd really love to do, if 
I said, it, it, it make the case that this duality is really topological. Now, of course, the setting of the question is not, right? The coupling concept in Mill's theory on, on, on um, three plus one dimensional space definitely depends on the metric. But I'd like to make the case that it's only the action of the Hamiltonian that depends on the metric. The S duality operator by itself, I, I don't have any proof for that, but this is, I think, what at least we see in the U1 case. The S duality operator by itself can be defined with, as an operator, can be defined without knowing the metric. Only if you act on it on the Hamiltonian, only the Hamiltonian knows about the metric. And it's through the commutation relations with the Hamiltonian that the metric enters. Now, I'm not sure if this is precisely true or needs some regularization, but I think I, I want to see what topological structures really underlie the S duality. We're working now on extending all of this to UN. UN just means I have to add N strings. And um, I should just mention related works um, that also had similar structures, although in a different context. Uh, especially the Especially when you study the Tukuma zero theory, the six dimensional Tukuma zero theory in length spaces, you get these structures. And I'm going to put here, sorry for running over time. Thank you.